science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. So exciting. As podcasts do, you may be listening to this months after the recording, but the pre-sale for Bunsen 2.0 and text from Bunsen went live to the general public. It had a little bit of glitches. We've worked them all out, um, and we're really excited that we're almost at the pre-sale goal to get this going, to get Bunsen 2.0, this giant stuffy of Bunsen that is adorable, um, as well as work on the audiobook and the ebook for text from Bunsen. I can't tell you how excited Chris and I are and how happy and how grateful we are for the community that wants the Bunsen stuff and the text from Bunsen stuff. It's so great. As mentioned in the weekly newsletter, Chris and I are in the busy season for teaching. The end of May and the middle of June, the next three weeks is super busy as classroom teachers in Alberta, Canada. Curriculum needs to get done. Final exams are coming up. All of the final marks are due and report card comments and planning for next year. So it's very, very, very busy. So you might see you might see the odd dip in Bunsen and Beaker content, uh, but we are trudging through to get all the science, empathy and cuteness to you. Adam started marching season. Um, If you're part of private Twitter, we're posting more family stuff there. So some videos of Adam playing in marching band. He had his first parade and it was super good. Okay, on to the show for this week. In science news, we're going to take a look at how parasites shape plant growth. How? What? It's such a cool study. In pet science, there is a Finnish study that looked at COVID sniffing dogs and uh, the results are amazing. Our guest and Ask an Expert is astrophysicist and science communicator, Dr. Parshivi Patel, who's going to wow us with some stuff about space and the importance of putting that information in bite-sized packets for the public. Hey, dogs, what happens if you get fourth place in a space race? Well, (laughs) you're awarded a constellation prize. (laughs) Oh, that's a bad one. Okay, I'm with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, we're going to chat about parasites and how they can control plant growth. Now, I saw this come up on a bunch of news sites um, that, that I subscribe to. It's how I get the cool articles we talk about every week. And this one was talking about how caribou parasites actually affect vegetative growth in the area the caribou caribou roam. So the story goes that I think we all understand the relationship between animals and other animals and also animals and plants, but also plants maybe in actual physical structures of the land. So there was a really cool uh, study where they reintroduced wolves and those wolves brought down the prey species and the prey species because their numbers were lower. They didn't eat the riverbank kind of like leaves as much, which actually affected the shade, which affected the fish, which actually affected the entire path of the river. So it's kind of like the butterfly flaps its wings in Canada. And if you are someplace else in the world, you feel it some other way. It's kind of like this ecosystem ripple effect. Now, a story for another time, that wolf story that we all know, how the wolves changed the flow of the river. In recent years, that has been heavily criticized and or debunked as being overly simplified and even romanticized about the power a prey species has to change the the course of a river. So there are ripple effects, but maybe not that strong. Now, what hasn't been really studied that much is how parasites may affect plant growth. Now, there's a good case study that this this study built upon that looked at buffalo and cattle. Uh, it was in Africa, sub, sub-Saharan Africa, where this, this virus called Rinderpest virus, anyways, it made these animals super sick and took out great swaths of them in the 19th century. Um, And because there wasn't as many buffalo and cattle and antelope, the vegetative growth in that area went bananas. They found a vaccine for the Rinderpest virus, uh, vaccinated the 
the animals. And, and that led to the vegetative growth being trimmed back and a whole bunch of other landscape changes. You know, you don't have as much, you don't have as much uh, grass. You're more prone to erosion. So it changes topographical areas of the earth. Now this rinder pest thing was pretty fatal. So wiped out a whole bunch of them, killed them. Most parasites don't like to kill their host, right? Because if you're a parasite, you don't want to kill your sugar daddy, so to speak. <laughs> you want to slowly suck away their nutrients, weakening them. So you live inside them to, you know, replicate and procreate and, and have a good party. So most parasites don't kill their host. The researchers in this study looked at the parasite the brown stomach worm. Um, uh, there's some gross pictures of it. It's a parasitic, parasitic worm, ew. And this worm affects caribou. Now, they took data. The team took data from a whole bunch of different studies that looked at the number of caribou in the in area versus the vegetative growth they would eat. And they ran simulations of how the parasite would affect the feeding practices of the caribou. Now, they didn't just guess. One of the interesting things was, is that in the simulation, they changed the parameters of what the, the, this parasite did. Instead of just weakening the caribou, they could just turn the dial up to 11 of like murder force. <laughs> and instead of weakening the caribou, it would wipe out a certain percentage of them. And they found that by wiping out the caribou and sickening the caribou had almost the same impact on the vegetation, vegetative growth. Now, what do the, what do these parasites do? Well, it's kind of common sense, but it, I found it so interesting when it was put to words. The parasite, of course, weakens the caribou. And if you're weakened, you are less likely to eat as much food. And because you're weak and you're not expending as much energy, you're not eating as much food. Um, so the animals who are weakened by the parasite just eat less vegetative growth. So this leads to the new question. Um, these parasites are super common. They're really common in caribou. And the question is, is what happens due to changing climate if the parasite is affected, like something makes them less able to compete and they are less likely to infect the caribou? The parasite in caribou stays, you know, a relatively steady level of infection. So in the simulation, they could also change the dial of how much percentage of the caribou is infected with parasite. Moving it up didn't really affect the vegetation that much. Moving it down did. So that's one interesting thing that they, they concluded is that ecosystems rarely look at the parasites involved within the whole cascade of interactions. And that's something that biologists maybe should think about. And it's a really interesting area of study. A concluding thought to think about is we all know that there's predator and prey interactions and in ecosystems, and they can be profound as they ripple throughout. But could there be more profound or equally profound interactions between parasite and organisms within the ecosystem? Food for thought. Well, especially if your food is somebody else's food, then you're a parasite. <laughs> okay, that's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk again about just how amazing the dog nose is. Now, we're all hopefully on the tail end of this pandemic. Uh, I hate to say it's over because there's still, in some places of the world, just as many people getting infected and still people are dying every week. Um, and where we live, they are. So it's not over. Um, but one thing that can help with the pandemic is knowing that you're positive and isolating so you don't infect others. So this study comes in as an idea for continued testing for COVID. The PCR tests are slow and it's tough to test everybody at once. Our province was testing everybody with those PCR tests. And when the infection levels were really high and everybody was getting tested, like we weren't knowing our PCR test for a day or two. And in that time, you could be out and about infecting people, or you could just be twirling your thumbs waiting. And then there's the at-home tests that we have, and they're not as accurate as PCR. So here comes 
the trusty canine. This study comes from the Helsinki University Hospital, where they created a, just an amazing test. It was a triple blind randomized study to see how accurate it is for dogs to correctly detect a coronavirus in a sample. This study has now gone to be published in the BMJ Global Health. And so it's like super legit, I love it. Now the conclusion is pretty fascinating. The dogs were able to correctly identify coronavirus in skin swabs in over 90% of the samples. And between the detection dogs, there was very, very little difference, meaning that there wasn't just like one all-star dog that got it 100% and another dog that got it 80, so the average was 90, <laughs> right? They were all, they all did really good. Now, in order to get a dog to detect coronavirus, you can't just po point like Bunsen or Beaker and say detect, right? The dogs had to be trained to, to figure out the difference between samples that had coronavirus on it and samples that didn't. So they were, they were basically positively reinforced when they were training to correctly identify the sample and they got better at it and got, they got better at it. Smelling things we obviously have no idea is out there, but they, they could smell it. After they were trained, they had their final exam, just like my students will be writing soon. And they were tested with hundreds of samples over, I think, a week. And they had to get a certain percentage of them correct. The samples were verified by PCR. So the gold standard in determining coronavirus positivity. The samples were either control, meaning they didn't have coronavirus in them, or they had coronavirus. And the handlers and everybody involved in actually working with the dogs didn't know what was going on. That's the blind aspect of it. That way, when there's two samples, there wasn't any body language that you could give off to the dog that they would give a false positive. And the dogs in their final exam scored 92%. So 92% of the time, they correctly identified a coronavirus sample versus a placebo sample. Now here's the fun part. So that's testing in the lab. Now it's time to go test people. Now, did they test people who were in a lab? Nope. They went to the airport. <laughs> they took these dogs to the airport for a real life situation. And as people were milling about coming, <laughs> coming on and off planes, getting swabs, the dogs gave a little sniff and the dogs did so good at detecting negative samples. Just about 99%. Now, I've heard and I've read different accuracies of those quick antigen tests, like the at-home ones, and they ain't above 90%. I'll tell you straight up. Now, the PCR tests are pretty good. You know, if the dogs in the lab got about 92%, the PCR tests are better. They're closer to 98 or something like that, 98%. But all it takes is the dog to smell your skin and they know you have coronavirus or not. So it's a little bit faster. It's mobile. And I think if I tested positive because a dog sniffed me rather than somebody jabbing a thing up my nose, I'd be, I'd have a, I'd be more okay with it. I was like, oh, at least I got to see a dog today. More evidence that that dog knows is so incredible. That's Pet Science for this week. Hello, everybody. The Science Podcast will always be free to download and listen to. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But we have some amazing ways that you can help us out with running the show. The first one is to think about becoming a patron on Patreon. And we call our patrons now the Paw Pack. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of awesome perks and different tiers of support. We also have a very detailed and excellent merch store. And if you're listening to this in time, we have pre-orders of the Bunsen 2.0 stuffy that was just adorable. Um, you can check it out. There's also the Beaker stuffy on our store and a whole bunch of comfy clothes. The third thing you can do is give us a good rating. Rate the podcast wherever you're listening to this. We'd love to get a great rating from you. Okay, back to the show. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I have Dr. Parshadi Patel, astrophysicist and science communicator with me today. How are you doing, Parshadi? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, 
where where are you calling into the podcast from? Where are you in the world? I am based in London, Ontario, Canada. Ooh, so okay, this all right. Is the location we call, you know, we call ourselves halfway between Toronto and Detroit. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it, um, are, have you lived in the Ontario region there for, for most of your life? Or are you here for your job slash, you know, career? Yeah, so I actually moved to Canada um, to pursue an undergraduate in astronomy, and mm-hmm. this was back in 2006, <laughs> quite a while ago. And right. since then, so I, I moved to Toronto first. I lived there for four years when I was doing my undergrad, but then I moved to London, Ontario to do my master's and my PhD, and then I just stuck around here. <laughs> stuck around. What, where did you move from, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I'm originally from uh, Ahmedabad, the Gujarat in India. So it's it's um, you know it's not very large city. That's probably why I like London. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but okay. it's it's you know still way bigger than London. Um, I grew up there. I did my uh, you know schooling there, and then two years of undergrad before I actually um, came to Canada. Hmm. Now, did your family come with you? Was it just you, or is most of your family back in India? No, so I actually came by myself. I was pretty. Oh my young. goodness, you're so brave. <laughs> I, I I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I <laughs> wasn't actually thinking. I was just like so passionate about wanting to study astronomy. I just decided, no, I have to like go for it if this is like what I want. And um, I I moved alone by you know by myself here. I had family friends who you know helped me through. Uh, <laughs> but even right now, my parents still live back home in India. Um, my brother does live here in Canada now, but uh, most of my family has been back home most of my life here in Canada. Was the first winter a bit of a shock? Yeah, I think. <laughs> it was a shock, but it was also exciting because oh. you know, I come from Amdaba where winters like now obviously has changed because of the, the climate change. But back in the day growing up, like winters, like 10 degrees would be like, oh, my God, it's like this once in a decade kind of thing, like, you know, pretty <laughs> cold. That's kind of the weather I come from. And, you know, in, in summer, it's like 40 degrees there. So. I was pretty excited to see the snow, have it like around. Obviously, after the first winter, I was like, well. Yeah, after a couple of days, it just it gets old. <laughs> that is so funny. Um, you know, that's not, not to generalize, but a lot of the scientists I've talked to that have moved to Canada from warmer countries, they all say that we're so excited for the snow. And then after they experience it, they're like, ah, you know, eh, yeah. winter's kind of winter's kind of overrated. <laughs> and you know what? I, I most love- most Canadians feel that <laughs> way, too. <laughs> yeah. And, and I love that, you know, there is different seasons and things to look forward to but I also sometimes just miss like six months of like 30 to 40 degrees (laughs) (laughs) oh my goodness I would not make it that's too hot for me oh I don't think Bunsen would make it Bunsen would just be cooking (laughs) yeah yeah it's super hot out there but I think one of the things that I do do miss um you know, now that I'm like into looking up at the night sky and things like that, like back home, it would have been much easier. Obviously, that's not the Mm. case now because of climate change. It's raining all the time instead of us having like a monsoon season, you know. Um, But I I wish I had known that, you know, I should be looking up to the sky earlier because then most of the year it's clear like there's no rain or clouds you know clogging your your view of the night sky but over here in Canada like most of our winters are just you know I mean I live in, in London which again is in a snow belt region so most of the time we're surrounded by clouds and lots of snow. <laughs> yeah. Now you mentioned you have an undergrad a master's and I introduced you as uh, Dr. Patel I'd be, could you give us a quick breakdown about your education? Yeah, so I, um, I actually, uh, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, I started actually with an undergrad in physics um, in in India. I started, uh, you know, doing my bachelor's of science there. uh, And I was, I was doing it in physics, but I wasn't really satisfied because I really wanted to study astronomy. And that was not something that was offered there. And, you know, the places that did have it, Um, you know, the seats were so uh, little in terms of the amount of people who were interested in that subject, I knew that I would have 
never gotten into it uh, if it wasn't until like my master's, my PhD. And so I decided to move halfway across the world <laughs> uh, to pursue a bachelor's in, in astronomy. And, and uh, I did, you know, I came to University of Toronto and then I realized being like, oh, my God, being an international student is very different, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, opportunities and scholarships and things like that you could have. So I decided to still continue doing my physics uh, undergraduate. Uh, so I have a bachelor's in physics and astronomy. Um, and then uh, I knew that I wanted to continue you know, to, into research. And, and I decided that uh, I, I wanted to stay in Canada because at that point I could have gone to other countries, you know, US or other places. But uh, I liked Canada enough that I was like, no, no, I want to stay here. And so I was able to um, actually move to Western University or the University of Western Ontario uh, here in London, Ontario, and uh, continue with my uh, master's in astronomy, but with a specialization in planetary science. And then also uh, continued to just stay there because I loved working with my supervisors. Um, I just stayed there for my PhD, doing the same thing in terms of, you know, doing, again, um, master or sorry, uh, PhD in astronomy, but with a specialization in planetary science as well. Hmm. So that's kind of the trajectory I took. It's a little bit longer than what normally people would have. But, you know, opportunities came at certain times and I just hopped onto them. So, okay, you were studying physics and then you really wanted to do astronomy. What was it? What was the thing that made you switch it into that gear? Like what, what clicked for you? Yeah. So, and it was actually, you know, I was very young. I was a teenager when I, um, when I learned that um, I, I really liked space. I just was mm -hmm. drawn to it uh, in terms of the amount of unanswered questions, just just plain being like, are we alone? Or, oh my God, well, there's so many things out there that we don't know about. And so I always had it at the back of my mind. And even in high school, like I remember always telling my teachers and my friends that I wanted to study astronomy. Um, but what it really kicked into high gear was the fact that, you know, my aunt who lived here in Canada, she visited um, and during one of the vacations and she brought me a small telescope. Oh my and goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's and it was it was small. It wasn't like anything really big, but it was good enough to see, you know, the planets. I could see Saturn's rings on it. Oh my goodness. Um, Jupiter and, you know, Venus and the moon and once like it took me a while I remember setting it up on my terrace and it took me a while to get it set up and when it did and I just like I was screaming and went to my mom downstairs <laughs> and be like you should come up, you know, you should see there's Saturn's rings, you know, you can see it from the telescope. Um, I kind of knew at that time that that is something that I wanted to do. Obviously did not know that just looking up at the night sky is not a job you can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just was really fascinated with the fact that, you know, just a small telescope could allow you to see something that is so far and something that is, you know, like a planet. It's like, it's a planet, but it's very different than us, right? So mm -hmm. those kinds of just simple things made me want to study astronomy because it was something that I could see. So I always loved stars and planets because that was something that was kind of visible to me in the night sky and it's something that I could connect to. Um, but then when I came here, I realized, oh my God, there's so many other things in astronomy you can do. <laughs> uh, I still stuck to, you know, studying planets and stars just because of that initial, uh, my curiosity kind of stemmed from just looking up uh, and looking at the stars and looking yeah. at, the, at the planets. So on a scale of one to 10, how excited you are you about the first pictures back from James Webb? 15? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's off the charts. <laughs> Oh, um, wow. Yeah, it, it is like, you know, as as someone who studied stars and how they form and the fact that James Webb is going to, you know, give us it, it's going to be studying galaxies, which are further away back in time. But it's also going to be studying planets and stars. I and, know. Oh, my and that's goodness. What's most exciting about it to me, at least. <laughs> I don't have a, a Ph.D. in astrophysics, but I 
some some nights I can't get to sleep because just personally I'm so excited about what this the web telescope is going to send back. So I can't imagine somebody like you in your position like groundbreaking stuff is coming, which is so exciting. Yeah, and I think it's it's it has been uh, in making for so long. <laughs> mm. I think people mm-hmm. are just. I think the excitement is tenfold than what would it would have been if it had launched just like the initial time frame or, you know, without any hiccups, but also at the same time, it comes at like such a great time where we've started to look at the universe in many different ways. It's not just looking at it. We're listening to it now too. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, it's like this era uh, and it's a perfect time to be looking forward to something too, you know, in this pandemic. Um, yeah. Something. Yeah. I know something to give us hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You work with planetary science, and to get your PhD, you obviously have to do some research. I would kick myself if I didn't ask you what that was. What did you do with planetary science? Yeah, so I um, uh, initially, I'll start back in my undergraduate. So, you know, I was always fascinated with uh, with planets and stars and how they form, um, kind of, you know, coming from that idea of like, you know, we're able to see the other planets, you know, in our solar system, we have so many. So I was always curious about that. And you know, and then in my undergraduate class, I actually had an opportunity to do uh, research on, you know, these disks that are basically around a star when it forms. These are, you know, material that are left over that the star didn't, um, uh, you know, it didn't fall onto the star to become a star. But it came with it as it was forming from the region because they they form in these areas called star forming regions. And this material comes with it as the star is forming. And eventually this is where like all the planets form. And I studied, uh, I was so interested, I actually went and looked for someone who studied that. And I had an opportunity to do research in, in understanding, you know, um, how planets as they're forming move around in the disk. And, and I got really, really intrigued by how these disks work around stars and how, you know, what kind of impact they have on the stars that form, on the planets that form. So when I was looking for my, uh, you know, master's, my PhD uh, projects, I was really looking for something that had to do with the disks. And it's, it's interesting how it went from like stars and planets to just being the combination of the two and trying to like understand, you know, how a, they be, both form from this material that is in the star forming region to, you know, um, all the way to how they interact and, you know, form kind of simultaneously sometimes. And uh, for my master's, I actually studied these, these stars that are, you know, way more massive, 10, 20 times more massive than our sun. Um, they are, you know, these, these giant stars that are like the bluish white stars that we see in the night sky. And they spin so fast that, you know, they spin at like 80% of the velocity at which they can actually rip apart themselves, <laughs> basically. So they spin very oh, fast. But what's, what? Yeah, they're very, very interesting. And, and that interesting aspect is that when they spin, they actually, the material comes off of them. And that itself forms a disk. So the disk that I studied for undergrad was the one that the star inherited as it was forming. And then you have these stars that are, you know, some like stars, but much more massive. And, and they spin so fast that they shed material. And, and then they form a disk. And the physics stays the same. So I was like, well, you know, I studied physics of these kinds of disks. Now I can study <laughs> physics of these kinds of disks. Um, and, and I was able to study how, you know, the observations we have of these stars, we can see these stars brightening and dimming over time. And using computer models, I was actually able to show that that was the star basically burping out material and that forming a disk and then the disk kind of falling back onto the star. Um, so my my passion for this kind of grew with my master's project. And, and so for my PhD, I kind of wanted to still go back to my original love of like, you know, young stars and and how they form and these disks where eventually you would have planets form. So I took all the knowledge that I had for my, you know, bachelor's and my master's on disks and, and decided to study these very, very young stars that form behind these thick disk of dust and gas. And (laughs) you cannot see the star itself while it's forming. 
but you can get light from the disc, which gives you a lot of information about the star that is hiding behind the disc. And so I decided to study that because, you know, I was also some of one of those people who's like, oh, no, many people do this. So I should, I should do it, you know, trying to figure out a four year project where someone has not really touched that area of <laughs> research. And, um, and I ended up studying these uh, these stars, um, they're called Herbig BE stars because they're named after George Herbig, who first found them. And I was able to study the amount of material that exists around these stars and how it interacts with the star itself as the star is forming. And all of this, you know, sitting just in front of my computer with a computer model um, that was developed right here at Western. Um, and, you know, the interesting part is that after the four years, I really only studied four stars, <laughs> which is, oh. yeah, it's very interesting that it took me four years to develop thousands of models to find what's around these disks just based on, you know, like we have this light from the star and then we have these data from, um, from these different telescopes uh, that we're getting and how that matches to our understanding of what is happening around the star um, by using a computer model. So it was a combination of, you know, taking data that already exists, um, taking new data with uh, amazing telescopes like the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, and then, uh, you know, taking a computer model that can create a star and disk uh, in a computer and then matching the two and trying to figure out what is actually happening around the star. Like it went... It's just like a, it's like an epic, like kind of emotional journey. Like you got yeah. this, the leftover stuff the star doesn't want becomes all of the cool things that we live on or we study as planets, right? It's like the yeah. star rejects stuff. That makes a disc which does its own thing. And now you're on to like, let's look at the thing behind the thing that you can't see. That's yeah. so wild. I love it. Definitely uh, a roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, did you find anything interesting? Like, was there anything shocking or was there anything like, wow, did we did now we know something we didn't before? Yeah, I think one of the things that I guess, I, I don't know if I could call that, but like a legacy of the project is, was that, you know, initially what people were doing were they were using the models that we apply for stars like our sun. And like I said before, these stars that I was studying are much more massive than our than our sun and the these stars are so interesting that when you change the mass you change a lot of things around them and when you apply models that are for certain kinds of stars and you take that model and apply to something else it necessarily does not work because you know the physics is different things around you know that's happening around them is very different and a lot of people around, uh, you know, in this particular field were basically taking models that work for these low mass stars and applying them to high mass stars. And we came in and we said, you know, let's forget about the models that exist. Let's start with a very, very simple <laughs> model of how these stars work and, you know, what physics happens. And let's start from there. And we were able to show that you don't need complicated physics that happens around the young, you know, low mass stars. You just need simple physics to be able to define what's happening around high mass stars. So, so we gave people a different way of looking at these disks uh, without any complicated physics that was necessarily not, not really necessary in, in the situations that we were working with, basically. And just to kind of bring it home for people that are listening that maybe aren't, you know, uh, didn't, didn't take a lot of sciencey space stuff in, in school, these disks become all of the planets. Like earth was once part of this disc around the sun, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when these stars are forming, uh, you know, they generally form in these, uh, regions, they're called stellar nurseries or star forming regions. They're basically regions of dust and gas and has all the right ingredients from where the the stars you know would form and take all the uh, the material that exists and and you know put itself into a ball but then there's always material left around it and then the way these stars form um you have all this material that's rushing into the center which is eventually where you would have a planet sorry you would have a star and then all the material that's around it is left over after the star is formed 
and that is still going to be there and it's going to keep going around the star um, and eventually, you know, they will bump into each other and form these tiny uh, boulders and eventually planets, depending on how far they're from the star. You can get, you know, rocky planets like we have in the inner solar system. Further out, you can guess, get gaseous planets and more further out, you can guess ice giants. Um, and so, you know, it's basically all thanks to those star forming regions, you know, all that material already exists as the star is forming. And then that's where, you know, all of these planets eventually form from. Hmm. I love it. It's so cool. <laughs> I could listen to you talk about this for hours, but um, I think we have to move to the next cl- question. Is that okay? Yeah, that's definitely- okay. So from from here, from studying the, these dust clouds and stars behind the dust, you now have moved into an area of uh, in your career with like science communication and outreach. Could you talk a little bit about some of the things you do with that? Yeah, um, I I think during my PhD, you know, uh, you might talk to a lot of scientists and they'll say, especially during PhD, you got to have things that you do other than your research. Mm -hmm. And my thing was, um, you know, volunteering with the the department, uh, working at the observatory and in the programs uh, where, you know, we just got people excited about space, as excited as we (laughs) were as scientists. And um, over time, it became my passion. I got really excited um, when, you know, I got to talk to people about there are so many awesome things in space. It's mind blowing. It's just so vast that it's so hard to even imagine what is out there. Um, and eventually I realized, you know, a year before I was going to graduate that I really had two options. I could go into research. Um, that was an option. Or I could go into outreach. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And, you know, and in science communication and, and just engaging people in this exciting field. Uh, and given the experience that I had acquired over my PhD, I ended up, you know, uh, just staying at the department where I had been um, volunteering for so many years and then te- being a teaching assistant at. Um, I ended up working as uh, an outreach coordinator, or, you know, coordinating their outreach programs um, after my PhD. And I got to do amazing things like developing programs that engage, you know, youth in, um, in after school, but also like summer programs. Um, I got to do these amazing events at the observatory. You know, we have an on-site observatory at Western and I got to create these events where different themes every, every year or every month, depending on, you know, what's happening in the world. Um, I got to interact with, public uh, on on so many levels and in so many different ways. Uh, And I I really liked that, you know, I could develop activities and programs and workshops and going to schools, work with educators um, and just, you know, put a little bit of tiny, uh, you know, spark into people's brain about about space. You know, people may have not thought about it Mm -hmm. or people may have known about it, but it's it's so big and so complex people are sometimes intimidated by it and so i get this opportunity to you know do all of these things which allows me to bring the excitement that scientists uh like me feel about this field and bring them to youth and and public who generally don't um look into space as a possible thing that they could could be interested in <laughs> i totally get it i'm a teacher and uh <laughs> <clears throat> nothing feels better than nailing a lesson and, and having kids just be super excited about whatever it is that's going on. Right. It's a pretty good feeling. I know it's yeah. you're, 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 what you're explaining is, uh, you know, out is a little bit bigger, um, running events and stuff like that, but, um, developing <laughs> the programs for people is, is pretty rewarding when, when you can get that spark going in folks. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things that I've, I've really enjoyed is that sometimes you, um, you know, being able to develop so many programs and events, um, you get people through different means, you know, sometimes, you know, I have, we have had events at, you know, chapters, we have had events at the observatory, we have had events, you know, in different locations. And sometimes people don't think about, uh, you know, 
running into a scientist at some place that they <laughs> might not see, right? Like, They're like, you're supposed to be in a lab. What are you doing out here? <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, and, and just being able to ask your question, you know, uh, that burning question you had about space and you just like walk into chapters and hey, <laughs> here is a scientist. Ask, ask a scientist a question. That's and, cool. And yeah, just get, getting, you know, going to places where people are, and talking to them about things that they didn't think they would talk about on that day, I think uh, I find that really exciting to be to be able to do that on everyday races. <laughs> yeah, you're just there to you know get your book and get your Starbucks, and now there's somebody talking about planets. What mm-hmm. a good deal! Yeah. That's a that's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that about your uh, your outreach and your science communication. That's really cool. Another thing that you're involved with that I'd love for you to talk about is women of color in STEAM. Could you talk to us about it? Yeah, I think um, this particular, uh, you know, it's, it's a grassroots organization and it's very, very uh, near to my heart because... As, as a woman of color, you know, when you walk into a conference or, you know, into into an area where you have a whole bunch of uh, other experts with you, it's very hard to find experts who look like you, you know, and, and I when I was growing up, I didn't. I didn't have a role model um, that looked like me that was in the exact field that I wanted to go into. Um, I, I grew up, you know, having my mom as a role model, having Kalpana Chala as a role model, but she was an astronaut. I didn't really want to be an astronaut, um, <laughs> but, you know, but she looked like me. So I always, I always was like, okay, you know, like she could do it. I could do it. I was taking um, more of like general things from her rather than particular path or, you know, things that I could have done to navigate to my career. And, and this organization actually came about in a, in a very interesting way. It was, you know, uh, four of us, uh, me, Dr. Krishana Shankar, Dr. Rupali Chaudhary and, and Dr. Bhairavi Shankar. Uh, we were at a conference and we were sitting there And talking about, we were, you're all women of color, talking about different things we have experienced um, as a woman, as a woman of color in STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, um, arts, uh, mathematics, and medicine. And all of us have this similar sometimes experience and we did not know how to navigate that and all of us had a different approach and so we were like you know how about we kind of get together and come up like with an organization that can really help women you know when they need uh, really what we need is champions in many ways you know people supporting other people um, and especially you know new uh, immigrant women who are coming into the field um, in Canada and just looking for that support, help, and, and, you know, wanting to know ways to navigate. And so our organization, uh, what we're currently trying to do is is basically support um, these women and and especially in the, the, the world of social media, because there are so many things that people could do and how they could navigate. We really just champion their voice and, and, you know, amplify um, what they're trying to look for or get, whether it's mentorship, uh, whether it's jobs, or just looking for other, you know, role models. Uh, and we try to do that um, and provide that support as much as possible. Is there a website or a Twitter page that we could link in the show notes for this? Yeah, we have a Twitter and that's where we're most active. And okay. So I can, okay. I can send you that. <laughs> sure. Okay. We'll make sure that's in the link links for people that may want more information. Um, Mm -hmm. so they can just, you know, it'll be hyperlink and they can just click right to it. Yeah, that would be awesome. Well, I appreciate you talking about that. Um, I know I'm not a woman of color, uh, (laughs) but, but I do have young girls in my chemistry class and they, you know, like I do show the guests that are on my podcast uh, every time that, that, that the episode comes out with their, them on it. And it is cool to see they they key in on it they're like that's somebody that looks like me you know um in that yeah. job and it's representation really matters yeah i think it's something that i did not recognize when i was young either and i didn't clue in on these things until like later when talking to 
other women of color in the field, right? So it's it's something um, that is to me now much more, uh, you know, something that I recognize very often, but it's not something that is very evident to a lot of people, um, except to those that, you know, real, to those who go through this. Well, yeah, like when I was a kid, if I wanted to go into science, I, like everybody was a white dude in science. Like I, like that was what they looked like to me. So, you know, as I had like Carl Sagan was on the TV, you know? So <laughs> yeah, uh, we have a couple standard questions that we ask on the podcast, which are kind of fun. We, we get to know our guests a, in a little different way than maybe other shows. I don't know. We were talking about that before, <laughs> before we started. And uh, one of the questions we ask our guests to share is a pet story from their life. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a pet story you could share with us? Yeah, I actually do. I was, um, you know, I currently don't have pets, which I'm very, uh, you know, not really happy about. But um, when I was growing up uh, back home in India, um, my dad's friend, he was moving to United States and he was, you know, he had a parrot named Snoopy. Um, <laughs> and he's like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with him. <laughs> Yeah. And uh and my dad is like, oh, we'll take him. <laughs> and that pair, oh my god, he was so adorable. Um, he absolutely loved my dad. I don't know what he <laughs> had um with him, but um he, you know, he would talk, he he wouldn't let my dad come back from work and not like, you know, if my dad just walks into his bedroom without actually talking to him. He would just like scream at the top of his voice to <laughs> talk. Be like, you know, you're home. You need to talk to me. <laughs> um, and, and I absolutely loved having, you know, a pet uh, while I was growing up. And I was a teenager at that time. So, you know, it's also like a cool thing to, to have. Oh, um, give you some it. street cred with your friends. <laughs> yeah, they all loved, you know, being... Um, especially coming in like early evening when we would take him out of the cage and let him like fly around the house and stuff. People would like absolutely love coming <laughs> to our house during that time. Um, but the really interesting thing about it is like, I didn't really realize how much um, the, the parrot meant to me uh, until uh, this one fine day, you know, we had uh, we had someone over who was cleaning our house and they left the door open. And that's mm. the time when we get him out of the cage. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure he was curious about what's out there. And he flew out and I went behind him just, you know, between houses and trying to jump and just follow um, and I couldn't track him and I, you know, my mom called my dad and he, he worked like, you know, half an hour away. He came running, we couldn't find him. Um, and I remember I had a test, a Hindi test. It's a, it's a language that we learned back home. And I remember failing that test <laughs> just because I was so upset that he didn't come home. Um, then, um, and, and at that time I realized that, you know, it was, it was so great to have it. He was a parrot, but I talked to <laughs> And, you know, just having yeah. that bond as you are, as yeah. you're growing up. Um, and, and so it's, it's still, uh, something that I think about all the time. Oh, I talk to my dogs all the time. So, <laughs> and they don't talk back. Well, Bunsen talks back sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love dogs. You know, one of the, the neat things about growing in India, growing up in India is like, we have lots of strays, like stray dogs, cows, buffaloes, monkeys, peacocks, like it's, a little like anytime even right now I go back home we find them all the time <laughs> you know, in and around and so even though after uh, Snoopy we didn't have a pet I always made sure to make friends with the the you know stray animals that were in our neighborhood and you make sure to feed them and, and play with them uh, uh. when we were allowed to <laughs> Well, I'm sorry about the loss of the parrot, but it's uh, it, thank you for sharing your story. It was really touching and um, <laughs> probably, you know, it definitely, definitely parrots are those, they're such interesting characters uh, yeah. because of their ability to vocalize, right? It gives them like a human characteristics because they have a human voice just about. So, yeah. And, and that's, I think one of the things that, you know, when I think back, I think about that every evening how he would call my dad <laughs> my dad didn't pay attention to him <laughs> you know when he walked into the house like he would 
call up my dad's name until oh. like and scream at the top of his voice until my dad is like, okay, I'm here. Let's chat. <laughs> <laughs> the other standard question we ask on the podcast, we challenge our guests to tell us a super fact, which is something that you know that when you tell people it kind of like blows their mind a bit. Uh, do you have a super fact you could share with us? Yeah, I generally I have two in my pocket that I generally talk about all the time woot because woot. I feel like <laughs> it gets people's like a minds like you know thinking about it, but it, it blows away at the same time <laughs> their mind. Uh-huh. Um, so the first one is that when you look at things in the night sky, you know, um, when you look at that star or you know the first light from from the the sun in the morning as it rises all of those things are actually things that you're looking back in time so for example uh we have the sun sun is at a particular distance away from earth and light actually travels at a constant speed and so it takes approximately eight minutes for the light that we're seeing now to come from the sun. So what you're seeing now is the light that you, that was, you know, that came from the sun eight minutes ago. So it was like, you know, you're looking back eight minutes. When you're looking at stars, the same thing in the night sky, if you're looking at a certain star that's, you know, let's say 110 light years away, um, light years is a distance that we use, um, you know, to, to measure things, but it also tells you, uh, you know, how much time back, it is. So, for example, if a star is 110 light years, it means it is the light that was produced by that star 110 years ago. That is what you're seeing now. Okay. So, uh, if you're looking at galaxies that are, let's say, 100 million years, uh, you know, uh, back in time, you're, you're looking at things that already happened. You know, the star you're looking at right now that you're seeing the light may not even exist right now. Oh. <laughs> and that I think is just, you know, people talk about traveling back in time and I'm like, you don't need to you just look up and you are already looking at things that existed before that you're seeing now and may not even exist right now. Huh. And, and so that's something that I know that always blows people's minds. <laughs> that is, that's wild. Yeah. And, and then the other one, which I think is very much, you know, kind of related to, to, each person is every element in your body um, came from, you know, well, most of it came from stars, dying stars. And the very little amount uh, that is the rest, actually tiny amounts of those came from the original Big Bang, like, you know, the the first thing that happened uh, in, in the universe and, and things that were formed were hydrogen and, and helium and a little bit of lithium. And so in your body, we have all these different elements. We have calcium in our bones, we have oxygen in our blood, iron in our blood, you know, nitrogen, all of these elements except hydrogen, all of those formed actually inside the stars and when they died. So basically when they go supernova, um, a lot of that material was actually formed in those stars. So we wouldn't really be here if the stars before us um, wouldn't have gone through their cycle and shedded all their material into the universe. And then eventually after many generations, our sun formed. And in that disk that is around the star, you get all of these elements that were shedded off from from these, these dead stars and that are not part of Earth and all of these planets and moons and, you know, asteroids and everything that we see in our solar system, but also every living thing on earth has material in them that was formed in these stars. So again, that's something that I find that is mind blowing. I think it's just so wild. Like everything about space just blows my mind. Like uh, somebody said, told me the other day, or I read it that aliens looking at us, if they're too far away, if they have really good technology would see dinosaurs or maybe no Mm -hmm. life on earth because the light from earth would have taken that long to get to them. Yeah. Uh, And it's kind of similar for us too, right? If you flip it the other way too, if you're looking for life, 
you know, you're <laughs> trying to look at a planet, you're looking back in time um, for that planet. So they might already have life now, but we're only seeing light that came, you know, depending on how far they have the, the planet is. So it's, it's so very interesting. Mm. I, the universe is complex, interesting, and marvelous all in the same <laughs> same page, you know? You know what? That's why I'm glad I'm talking to somebody like you, Doc. We need people like you to kind of parse that out and make it understandable to the public. So, yeah, those are great super facts. Thank you. <laughs> so the last question of the podcast is the important to you question. It's a, a, I give We give guests a chance to just chat about things that they're passionate about. Some guests talk about causes, yeah. some talk about hobbies. Yeah. What uh, What did you want to talk about? I think uh, one of my hobbies that has kind of become my passion, you know, similar to, you know, I do science communication all the time, but I talk a lot about space and, and, and something that I, I didn't do often as I was growing up was actually looking up at the sky. Um, you know, I had that teeny telescope when I was a teenager, but now, um, uh, living in Canada, you know, the nights that are clear and further away from, from the city, um, I have developed this passion for actually capturing the night sky. Uh, and, mm. and I'm still learning. It's, it's still like, you know, I'm an amateur, um, astrophotographer, uh, trying to capture, you know, what we see, like the Milky Way, the constellations and, how the fact that you know the cities and the light from the cities is actually hindering our vision of what beauty we have in the night sky um for example i live in london ontario it's it's a city i need to drive at least 45 minutes if not an hour outside the city to be able to observe you know the Milky Way with with my eyes without actually you know using any any cameras or anything like that and the more you know more urbanization happens the more we're losing the night sky to the light even now when I go onto the lake to you know um, to look at the night sky I see light from far away cities and towns that basically hinders our vision of the night sky and it's the more this keeps happening the more we are losing and a lot of students and kids don't have that opportunity to actually drive out somewhere or go camping and a lot of people have actually not seen Milky Way mm -hmm. even though you know it's it's something that you can see in the night sky only thing is, you know, if you're living in the city, there is a lot of light pollution. So I try and capture as much as I can on my camera and share it with people to to see, you know, I always start when I go to classrooms or, or I'm working, um, you know, talking to public, I always start with an image that I've captured right here in southwestern Ontario and ask people, how many of you have seen a sky like this? Hmm. And most of the time, maybe you have a a hand up or maybe couple, you know, um, who have had an opportunity to go camping and look up. Um, but most of the time, most of the people have not. And it is sad because <laughs> it is yeah. something that's available for free, <laughs> you know, um, and something that connects us back to who we are in terms of, you know, you're looking at the stars, you're looking at the galaxies, you're, you're looking into uh, an area which you know we as in a solar system and sun is part of we're part of a galaxy and um and you know it, we can see it from here but not right now because of all the light pollution so i tried to like use my my passion for for hmm. photography and combine it with my passion for space and bring it to people that way yeah it's just so profound and it's something that i know as as cities grow i there's ways you can limit light pollution, but they're just more expensive and they don't mm -hmm. look as nice. So it's going to, it's going to take more education of the public. I think I know Jasper in Alberta, where I live, Jasper mm -hmm. is a dark light, uh, dark night preserve. So it's yes. like, it's all of their lights are angled down. They have mm -hmm. shields around them. And uh, it's like you very little light pollution comes from Jasper when you're out there, which is kind of cool. 
Mm -hmm. So, And that's the thing we have, you know, uh, here in Canada, we're lucky we have so many parks and areas that we could go to, uh, to experience this. Um, but, you know, I also think about these times when, you know, a few generations ago, you know, they could sit outside at night and, and look up and they wouldn't have issues like what we're facing right now, you know, um, and they would have had the experience this is why we have the stories that come with the constellations and how it's related to the seasons and things that go around here on earth is because back in the day people had that opportunity to just be able to sit out and and see those things yeah they were clear and as now, day yeah yeah and now we have to go to these you know dark sky preserves to be able hmm. to see that um and then most recently, uh, you know, now we're going to to start seeing many more um, different kinds of pollutions. You know, we have the light pollution, but now we are going to have more and more satellites that are going to be launched, you know, that are going to be in low Earth orbit, which means as an astrophotographer, when I'm taking pictures of the night sky, I'm now going to have these streaks of these satellites that are going to be hindering my view <laughs> of, of the of the uh, the universe. Uh, and so it's 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 a problem we have to solve but you know if it, i just say if listeners if you guys have an opportunity to just maybe take a day or if you have an opportunity to go camping just just try you know look up uh if it's clear um it is something that is very different than what you would see in cities you can easily mm -hmm. recognize constellations in the cities when you start going to darker areas you it's going to be hard for you to recognize the constellations that you did in the city <laughs> Uh, I think about that all the time. We're so fortunate where where my family lives. We live on a a farm outside of um, a small city in mm -hmm. Alberta, and there is light pollution from the city definitely more now than there was a decade ago. But we mm -hmm. still have like dark skies, and That's and amazing. not everybody gets that. And and then you think about like from the big cities, you have low income families that the kids yeah. just don't get to experience that unless they get help from a system like a school system taking them on a field trip or something. So exactly. Yeah. And that's, that is something that I've noticed more um, that, you know, people, people are starting to recognize that there are these, you know, inequalities where people, mm -hmm. some people have access, some people who do have opportunities to go to these places, they can do it, but others don't. And then you miss out on, maybe igniting that spark in there that you go child. yeah that's it <laughs> who might get excited about space just by having seen the milky way once with their naked eyes oh man every time i see the northern lights at our place like it just i post pictures of it on social media and folks from around the world that live in big cities are south of where you would see the northern mm -hmm. lights they just can't believe that it's a thing that happens you know the whole sky is covered with color um, yeah but it, you know, that, that is profound. It's something that mm -hmm. is, it is free. <laughs> it is free. You just got to go outside. Exactly. And it is free. And it's in the, and I think this is one of the reasons why during pandemic, um, uh, just looking up at the night sky and astronomy as like a hobby has been very popular is because mm -hmm. it, it is free. Um, you know, you can go in by telescope if you want, but you don't need to, you know, um, and you can do so many things just by looking at the moon, looking at the planets, constellations. Yeah. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to see the Northern Lights as well, it's, it's one of my bucket list items <laughs> is, to, is to look at the yeah. Northern Lights. And, and you're a little too South in London, I think. Well, so I, I did, I have seen Northern Lights once here oh. in, in, in just North of London in 2013. Um, but that was the only one time and I was very new into photography and I actually have pictures of the Northern Lights, but they're oh, all cool. out of focus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, the new cameras, though, like I just use my iPhone and it uses like some kind of like freaky deaky AI algorithm mm -hmm. to take a, the perfect picture of it with the slider. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Like... <laughs> and, and, and again, this is something, you know, um, a lot of people have access to phones. You don't need fancy cameras. You can take pictures of the night sky now and constellations even without having to to shell out thousands of dollars of, you know, fancy DSLRs or anything like that. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing your passion for nighttime photography, astrophotography. I love that sounds 
It's really cool. It, it's made me think about maybe I should take some more pictures of the night sky where I live because we do have very little light pollution. So you've I in, you've, would definitely encourage you to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you've ignited a spark in me. <laughs> Perfect. My work is done. <laughs> Yay. Well, Dr. Patel, this has been an amazing chat. Thank you so much for giving up your time to chat with us on the Science Podcast. Uh, can people follow you on social media? Yes, please. Thank you, first of all, for having me. And yeah, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, my handle is partially Patel, very simple. Um, and I tweet about food, space, astrophotography, and sometimes, you know, funny things. So feel free to follow me there. Well, the Milky Way is a type of candy bar. So there's some food right there. Right, yep. I actually, I think I have some pictures of different uh, bars that are like all space themed. Like there's galaxy <laughs> one, there's a comet one, there's a meteor one. And I was Yum. trying to find them and I always take pictures of <laughs> anything <laughs> space that I find. We'll make sure those links to your social media accounts are in our show notes along with the women of color in steam. Thank you so much. Okay. It's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. I will start. If you didn't know, it was my birthday yesterday. Whoop, whoop. At the time of recording this, that might be too loud. <laughs> yeah, at the time of recording this, it was my birthday yesterday. So May 24th. Um, and we had a birthday party. So because uh, no one was feeling sick and... Because the restrictions on COVID were lifted, we did get to have a party this year at our house. So that was nice. That was nice not to have it, you know, not be a birthday party. But we took the necessary precautions. Precautions like I didn't blow up my candles. I pinched them out and stuff like that. So no COVID was spread. Hopefully. Um. But yeah, it was my birthday, and there was there's there's a few people over. Um. There was my grandpa's. And uh, Annalise was over, mom, dad, Duncan, all, every, a couple people were over, yeah. And Beaker was so excited. Beaker's <laughs> favorite thing is people. Beaker's favorite thing is people. She loves people. And when there's so many, there's, when there's so many people in the house to her, she, she got so excited because she loves people. Um, but yeah, Bunsen was also gonna- really excited. She had a giant smile, like the hugest smile. Yeah, she was very, she's very googly, googly, googly dog. Um, and then Bunsen was also fairly excited, but he contained his excitement because he's big bear that's not supposed to be excited by people. Um, but yeah, that's my story. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. My story is birthday continued. So we. Uh, Adam, Annalise, and I went to Co-op, which is uh, a place that uh, we have here in town. And they that's actually the place that I take all your um, stuffies to, to have them mailed away and reach your humble abodes. Uh, but Co-op also is a grocery store, and they also have a fantastic bakery. So um, I may have found a hidden delight. It's called their... Uh, carrot cake muffin. Oh, they're so good. Or would you call them cupcakes? Would you they're, say they're like they're carrot cake cupcakes? They're so they're good. Carrot cake cupcakes. And so I bought those and then Adam picked a chocolate variety of cupcakes. And then he also bought these things called cannellonis. What are they called, Adam? Cannolis. 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 Yeah. And they're those were canola a, oils. They were such a hit. Um, but because we were serving cupcakes, Bunsen was really hoping that he would get a pup cake because as we know, recently it was Beaker's birthday and recently it was his birthday and pup cakes were had at those parties. <laughs> Bunsen was a little disappointed that he did not get a cupcake, pup cake or a carrot cake, uh, uh, cupcake and that's my story dad do you have a story wasn't bunsen like licking the counter like a cow yeah he was doing his cowlick counter uh, his move. Head's about the size side like his head is about the height of the counter and, and he just then tilts he it tilts, to the side 
<laughs> to the side, he goes Bleh, with this giant tongue. And yeah, he he's like- got cow brown eyes, and then he's like, Bleh, and he's like slow and methodical, like a cow when he does it. Yeah, yeah he, he, he won't that. jump up. He will not jump up, but his tongue will reach the counter. Bleh. Yeah. So my story is about Beaker and Ginger. Bunsen and Ginger get along great. Bunsen loves Ginger. Um, I think Bunsen's realized that Ginger is very indifferent to Bunsen's existence. So Bunsen originally really wanted to make friends with Ginger. Um, and now they're just like, they're buddies. But B- Bunsen has stopped kind of following her around and trying to, you know, trying to make friends with her. But Beaker on the, the other, other day, hand. The other day, Jason, I had Ginger and I was trying to... Um, let ginger go for a ride on bunsen okay. and bunsen really was not do- having any of it he just kept doing the butt turn butt budge turn away move yeah, yeah. well he's probably seen what has happened in what the- coming up in my story so occasionally beaker and ginger get into a scrap um beaker follows ginger very closely i don't know maybe she's trying to herd ginger and then Ginger lets Beaker know she's way too close. She meows and hisses at her. At her. Would and you then, say that? Would, would you would you say that Beaker is like a woman driver? Follows too close. Well, I'm not going to say anything sexist like that on the podcast. <laughs> Adam always tells me I followed too close. Mom, okay. why are you so close well, to that maybe driver? That's just what Chris's do when they drive. But okay, um, yeah. So eventually, Ginger has enough. And the fight is on. Turns around, swats Beaker in the nose. And for a half second, Beaker is stunned because nothing moves as fast as a cat moves with attack. Because this is beyond the realm of things Beaker has ever had to experience. So after Beaker gets swats, then Beaker's like, that's it. And the fight's on. So Beaker growls and then tries to hit the cat with her paws and chases the cat. Um, the cat just runs away because it's faster than Beaker and way more agile, jumps up high. So that happens, I'd say, once a day, Chris. There's a there's a bit of a, a scu- scuffle. But uh, they, yeah, but once you a know, day, once every two days. I don't know. But the, the funny thing is, is they they still like Ginger is not scared of Beaker. Ginger comes right back for more. And Beaker is not scared of Ginger. And it can, this continues day on and day on. And then when it's time to sleep, they sleep next to each other. It's so weird. One night, two nights ago, they both slept side by side in our bed. I, I was like, what is going on? And literally a half an hour ago, they had had a little fight and Beaker's nose was bleeding from getting swatted. <laughs> so I don't really get it. I know Ginger has no fear of Beaker because she just hide from Beaker all the time, but she doesn't. Runs away, jumps up high. Five minutes later, it's back to normal. So that's my story. That's a great story. Okay, well, that's the end of the uh, oh, that's the end of the short time. My section on this podcast. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Maybe next time we'll do the mailbag. Get, bring that back. Uh, maybe not. Who knows? That's the surprise. Um, but yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye. That's it for another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. Special thanks to Dr. Parshadi Patel, who talked to us all about space and initiatives in STEAM. We would also like to give a special shout out to the top tier members of the of the Paw Pack. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Take it away, Chris. And Schlarm, Sharon Dotson, Peggy McKeel, Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Julie Smith, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmenter, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Giger, Leela Periello, Lisa Swartz, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathert. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh.